Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's live stream. So today, like everybody's been talking about, is Solana was down and now it is back up. And we're going to take a look at exactly what happened, what potentially the problems were, and of course, the price action that followed. So if you haven't heard so far, uh, Solana has taken quite the tumble. And uh, it was a, a reason was because it actually shut down. And we've been doing pretty good, quite honestly. We've been doing great. We uh, we had almost almost a full year of no shutdowns. There were some slowdowns here and there and some some uh, some different things that happened in the background. But in all honesty, it was doing pretty good. Except for this morning when I woke up and I got bombarded with messages that, hey, Salon is down, Salon is down, Salon is down. What do you think about that? And I think, well, it's par for the course. Every time we think we know where the market's going, and the next big thing and the next ETH killer, eh, we get slapped back to reality. And here it is. Now, does that mean that uh, the price action was awful? No. And we'll take a look. So I just put this, this tweet out. Gosh, this was probably two, three hours ago. Oh, my God. Eight, almost four hours ago. And I said, hey, uh, well, we had a good run. Looks like Solana's down, folks. Let's hear comments from the non-Solana chains. And let me tell you, when other chains go down, there is no shortage of people who have invested in other chains to talk about how trashy the original chain actually is. Steven just said it's brutal. That's fine. And I'm going to skip that one. And uh, and some, some are reasonable responses. Like Elevator says, hey, the car goes 400,000 miles an hour, but there's a catch. Gringo Hodel says it's probably not wise to base the future financial system on a network that can just randomly shut down, even though the product is worth billions of dollars and more centralized than other big chains. Someone else also said that, they said that, hey, TradFi is not going to take this if uh, if a certain chain just goes down you know, at a moment's notice. And I said, well, in all honesty, I mean, isn't that what the stock market does every so often? If there's uh, too much price action going, going a certain way, it just shuts down and no one can trade? Eh, I think they're used to it. So they're actually in good company. But it doesn't excuse the fact that Solana did shut down today for almost six hours. Avi says it right. He goes, I don't like being a hater, but but any other chain with that many outages would have become a laughing stock in the crypto community. But somehow Solana is being excused and forgiven over and over again by the dip. Chad says, imagine that ledger went down. Nebly says, hey, Hex has been up 100% all the time, fully decentralized. And then Marco says it quite wisely. He says, the real question when it comes down to is this, where are you in blockchain? I came here for a replacement for the financial system. Do you care if it's fast and an unreliable system or some slower and more reliable system? I care, and therefore I choose Cardano over Solana. So before we get all twisted into the comments, that's fine. People have their opinions, and that's what makes the world go round. I will just say that uh, the reason why we're highlighting this specific issue, first of all, I own Solana. I own Cardano. I own Nier, I own Bitcoin, I own Ethereum, is because for quite some time, we have been lauding and applauding the greatness that is Solana, right? And all the different meme coins that are out there. Now, some people were pretty staunch that I hate this chain and they made no bones about it, but we had highlighted just how good it was doing. So when it goes down for six hours, you better believe I'm going to talk about it because that's called balance. And that's where everything becomes fair. So I sent this out. This is from a website, SoulScan. You can find the link in the description. You can verify this data, data yourself. And you get to see that under here on February 6th at 0948 UTC time, 111 minutes, almost essentially two hours, there was no, there was no transactions, no TPS, you know, transaction per second, nothing. And then, of course, right now you can go and verify that, yes, it's skyrocketed up to 3,000, 3.2. Congratulations. And if you also look at SoulScan under transactions, you can see that uh, this was the screenshot that I put in my X account to show people, like, look, the most recent one was two hours ago. So if anybody's saying, no, it wasn't down, no, it was just a slowdown, no, it went down. And of course, right now we can see that, yes, everything's going just fine. Less than a minute ago, all these transactions came through. Although I am concerned, though, because some of these transactions seem to keep, uh, I don't know if this is failing or if there's an error or what's going on, but uh, that's what's happening on Solana. Don't shoot the messenger. Just show me what the heck's going on, what's happening. And then lastly, you take a look at status.solana.com. We can see that, yes, the outage began at approximately 0953 UTC, lasting five hours, almost six. Let's round up. 
So when anybody says it's a slowdown and it wasn't really an outage, it's an outage. Can we just agree that? I don't know how many other places I got to find this, but this is directly from Solana. It was an outage. It was just an outage. It was an outage. However, from Solana status, it says block production on Solana mainnet resumed at 1457, following a successful upgrade to V1.17.20 and a restart of the cluster by all data operators. And don't let anybody say, oh, it just went down because they were upgrading. That wasn't what it was. Over here, block production on Solana mainnet resumed at 1457, following a successful upgrade to V1.17.20 and a restart of the cluster by valid operators. Engineers will continue to monitor performance on a network. Operations are restored. And again, the outage began at 0953. That was five hours ago. So don't tell me that it was just because of a upgrade. Okay. We cool? Great. Now here's what the price action did. <laughs> Absolutely nothing, quite honestly. So we can see that uh, I, it's a weird thing. And I, I find this quite bullish between us is that, you know, if Bitcoin, okay, let's just, let's just say it. Let's just call it. If Bitcoin went down for six hours, what do you think would have happened to the price? And you think the price would have rebounded? No, I think we're all on, no, on, we're not on the disillusion that there is a, a piece of centralization a little bit on Solana. And of course, everybody will say, well, the Nakamoto coefficient and taking a look at it. But if you take a look at the validators and see how they, they're clustered together and who actually owns and operates those things, look, I'm not here to disprove of what you want to invest in. I invest into it. But I'm saying there is something to be said for when people talk about the different problems that it has. Solana does have problems. Bitcoin has problems. Ethereum has problems. Cardano's got problems. Everything's got problems. If there was a perfect chain, everybody would be using it and we wouldn't be doing all this maxi stuff. So that's just how it is. And to prove my point, to, to, move, a, to move along, is this. It doesn't matter sometimes how great a chain is and how good it is and how decentralized it is and how fast it is and everything else. Sometimes you just get screwed. Finance. Just delisted Monero today. And the price obviously tumbled 20%. And it'll probably keep tumbling. I don't know if it's going to rebound or not, but that's a big blow. Is that is that because Monero is awful? No, it's a great chain. It does great things, and especially if you're doing privacy transactions. So why is it down 20%? It's because one exchange decided, hey, we're not going to keep having this. And there's a, probably a reason for that because the U.S. government got their tentacles into them after they sued CZ and Binance together. And uh, there was provisions made. So I'm not going to delve into that cesspool, but I'm just saying sometimes it's not the greatest chain that wins. Sometimes it's just happenstance and crappy luck, quite honestly. And then to prove my point further, I, I put out this tweet. And I said, look, I'm going to take a tour across North America and Europe this year, which we probably will do. Uh, we are doing. And I need recommendations for the best restaurants in your city. Because when I went to, I've, I've gone to Europe twice for guys, uh, for Coin Bureau's event to speak there. And every time I went there, I had the worst food because I, I got stuck in a bunch of tourist traps. So I said, hey, what's what's a good place to eat? And a lot of people, Patrucio says, hey, man, if you're in Portugal, Sushi Star, Latraria for beers, if you come DM me, I'll do that. Yeah. Uh, crypto Golfer. Captain Harams, <laughs> Harams in Sebastian, Florida, great food. And then uh, Chris Pax, if you're in Boston, an Italian restaurant, North End is fantastic. And it's just on and on. Mostly it's people going, hey, hit me up for beers, which <laughs> sounds good too. But a lot of people are just telling me like, look, this, these are the greatest restaurants. You need to go here. And I get you. They are great. They're probably awesome. They're probably super tasty. Probably price is right. Ambience is fantastic. The cook is top notch. But guess what? All these places pale in comparison to the winner. And the winner is McDonald's. McDonald's. And it's not because McDonald's is awesome. McDonald's is horrible. You know, it's just bad food. However, it's, and some would say, well, it's fast. Is it really that fast? Have you been to McDonald's lately? Try getting some food. It's probably actually kind of slow. 
And some people say, well, it's cheap. Have you been to McDonald's lately? It's not even that cheap anymore. It doesn't matter sometimes. Sometimes you just get one of the worst becomes the best just because of marketing and know-how and public hype and things behind it. And that is why I'm always stressing the fact to diversify. I don't care what your you think is going to rule the world in, in, in the future. The truth and the matter is of what I can tell is that no chain is perfect right now. I could be wrong. Maybe there's a perfect chain out there. Enlighten me in the comment section. But this is why I diversify. And Bitcoin's the most battle tested. That's why I have mostly Bitcoin. So I know right now everybody is squinting their eyes to see if I have invested into their token. <laughs> and it doesn't matter. Do you think I'm a genius? I'm not. I'm actually not that smart. I've just been here a lot longer than most of you. And that's why I've been successful because I've stuck around. And that's really all you gotta do. It's just like the army, just wear the right uniform, show up and you get promoted. It's very simple. The big thing is though, when are you gonna, when are we gonna actually gonna sell? And that's it. That's all I really wanted to, to talk about on this piece. So look, um, let me just think about that in the comment section and uh, we'll go from there. Also. Uh, before we get into Q and A, I've got a I've got a special guest rolling in in a, in a little bit, and I want to talk to you guys about this Celsius. So Celsius exit bankruptcy. Apparently, it's happened right now. Aaron Bennett did has done fantastic fantastic videos on what's happening, and of course, you know that you know you're getting your money back, everybody. Now it's not a, you're not being made 100 percent whole and everything else. There's a new one he just put out less than 24 hours ago where well, they just found another 1.2 billion and you're getting more money back. Hey, that's fantastic, right? So these are good news. However, once this happens and things get out of bankruptcy, there are some other things we need to think about, tax implications. And that's why I brought my buddy on, David from Coin Ledger, who stuck around for me rambling on for 15 minutes about it, about something that didn't, <laughs> didn't, you didn't have to listen to, to talk about tax implications. David, thanks for stopping by, man. Yeah, it was good hearing about McDonald's from you. <laughs> hey, hey, man, I mean, everybody says like, like McDonald's, honestly, it's not that bad. Just you can't eat it every day. It's just awful, 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 awful. <laughs> I would agree with that. So, so here's the thing. I, um, let's go over this. So now we know that Celsius is out of bankruptcy, right? So how does that, uh, with FTX, and we talked about this last time you were on there, but FTX and Voyager and BlockFi and all those stuff, I don't know the implications, but how does that work for taxes? Because we're, are we like less than 70 days away from everybody having to file? Yeah, and then what is it? It's like February 6th today. And so yeah. here in the U.S., April 15th, we got like a little over two months, about 70 days. Yeah. Um, but what, what does it mean? It's going to be similar to what we talked about with Voyager, you know, similar um, things going on from like a bankruptcy perspective. And so for the users who have lost money um, and lost digital assets, it's important to... One, have records because you need to know what your cost basis was in the assets you had held up on Celsius, right? So if I had $20,000 worth of Bitcoin, let's say that was 0.8 Bitcoin, whatever it is, right? Um, and I get back, let's say 0.4 Bitcoin from Celsius. Well, my basis of $20,000 still applies to that 0.4 Bitcoin so that should I ever dispose of that Bitcoin, I get to realize that loss or potentially gain, but I'm benefiting from that taxable um, loss essentially, right? Because if my basis is 20,000 and I yeah. wind up selling 0.4 Bitcoin for 10,000, I get that $10,000 loss benefiting me on my taxes. And so at a high level, that's how it works. There is nuance of course in how they actually go about distributing um, the funds back to folks. Is it paid out in fiat? Is it paid out in crypto? And I actually don't know. Have you heard how they're going to do it? So on some, on, I believe it's for the international customers, they're going to go through PayPal. And then for the U.S. Mm -hmm. customers, it's a little bit different. I think you're going through Coinbase. 
Correct me in the comment section, everybody. So PayPal on one, Coinbase on the other. Interesting. On the PayPal side, are they paying out people in fiat currencies? Or I would imagine so, because PayPal doesn't have a ton of crypto support. Fiat. I know they have some fiat. Yeah. So that's a good example where if you're getting paid in fiat, you have it what's likely a taxable event because if you lost Ethereum, you know, let's say your basis in the Ethereum that you lost access to was $50,000 and let's say you get $20,000 worth of fiat back, that's a taxable event and you realize $30,000 of losses. Oh, so someone correct me. Coinbase International and US PayPal. That's weird. Okay. Mm. All right. Well, whichever well, way see. it is. So w whenever it happens, I'm happy to come on and break down how it's going to work. I don't have the exact details, right? Like I do for the Voyager process, but yeah. I'm happy to walk people through. If they have any questions, you know, feel free to hit us, hit up our team at CoinLedger. We're happy to answer your questions completely for free too. Yeah. But I mean, it, the same theory is, is the same. If they have to sell your crypto and let's say exactly. that, let's just, let's just say for argument's sake that for PayPal, they're just going to give you back fiat, right? So if they have to sell your Bitcoin and they give it to you in fiat or even into a stable coin, because I believe PayPal has a stable coin now, that's still yep. that's still a taxable event because you're taking it from one crypto into another crypto. And that is you're essentially selling it for some type of value in another form. So it'd be that way. And then Coinbase would be the same thing. So gotcha. Exactly. And so people are going to get losses that they can write off on their taxes, which will reduce their tax income, which is good. Obviously, the whole situation is bad, but you can take advantage of the tax savings. Gotcha. So let's talk real quick about what you guys got going on over CoinLedger. So well, last time you were on here, I got a lot of people asking me about this, the portfolio tracker, because they want to be a part of that. How, again, can they be a part of the 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 portfolio tracking. Now, if, if, if no one knows it, it's very simple. You plug in your wallets. It's just, it's a read only type of thing. I've already done this myself. I've already gone through the process. It's not like they're going to be able to like steal all your crypto. Let's hope not. Just kidding. So with that, it, it'll show you like, okay, you're up here, you're down here. If you sell at this point, this could be a, not only a taxable event, but a, a short term or long term cap gains type situation. And then it'll kind of like break down what your what your PL is, your profit and loss. So what else? First of all, two things. What else is going on behind the scenes with 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 this, with the uh, portfolio tracker? And how do they sign up for that besides the uh, wait list? Yes. <clears throat> so to get the portfolio tracker, is something we've been building for now about a year and a half. Um, you know, historically, we've been very tax focused, tax first. But now, yeah. now we're essentially expanding our infrastructure to do more real time reporting, show real time, hear all your assets across all of your wallets. Here's where you're in profits. Here's where in your loss position. Exactly what you said. Um, that product is right now code complete. It's done. We're just going through the final phases of testing with it, making sure that all edge cases are ironed out. There's no gaping problems. And so in the next two weeks it's going to go to its formal beta launch but if you want access now all you got to do is simply sign up for coin ledger and ping help at coinledger.io with your username saying hey i want access to the portfolio tracker and then our team will essentially just add your username email address to an automation on our side which will kick out an email to you saying hey here's your access to coin ledger portfolio tracker keep in mind it's still beta so we're still doing that testing ironing out things but you can get access to that now just got to go sign up and ping our team saying, hey, I want access with your email and we'll kick that off. Gotcha. And then uh, the big question, how much is it per month? So portfolio tracker is free. So that's going to be a completely free product. People can jump in, you know, connect their wallets. Like you said, you don't actually have to connect your wallet. You can just paste your address. We don't need any access. Of oh, sorry. Yeah. So no, no ability to steal any crypto. Uh, but but totally free. And then, you know, we monetize, aka we make money by selling tax reports. So if we do a good job tracking your portfolio and you like what we're doing, maybe you'll eventually want to buy a tax report from us, which is the business model. Which is the business model. Although I will just tell everybody, like, look, if you've got five or 10 transactions or even up to 50, I think, you know, I don't think you really need this. I think you can do it yourself. But for me and for some of the other people who have been around for quite some time, this is just, uh, there's only one commodity in the entire planet that you can't buy more of, and that's time. 
I will pay for time at every single chance I get because, I mean, we don't know how much time we have on this planet. So I will pay for this because I don't want to roll through a bunch of, of spreadsheets and do it myself and go over this and that. I just sign up. First of all, there's a, there's a core feature. It's free. And then if you have up to 100 transactions, it's 50 bucks. Investors, 100. And then me, I've got more. I'm not a pro, but I'm just saying I've got a lot of different transactions. It's over 3,000 plus. It's 200 bucks. And then I just send it over to my CPA and she does all the, all the heavy lifting. So that is uh, it in a nutshell, if you guys want to try it. So that's what I've been using. And David, we've been work doing this, what? This is our third year, right? Yeah, you've been an awesome partner of ours. And this is year three with working with you. So, you know, it's, it's fun, to, fun to keep it rolling <laughs> and keep building new stuff. I know. Aristotle Plato says, Rob sounds like a home shopping channel presenter. <laughs> I got to tell you, it's not, uh, not too far off.